Oh, damn! You right now? Was it your daughter that kind of motivated you to do it? Absolutely or? not. <laughs> <laughs> she came uh, She came to the game a little bit uh, shortly after I came back. Um, the abbreviated version, if there is one, is uh, an actor by the name of Abraham Ben Ruby. Um, he's a very tall actor. He was on ER. A uh, lovely, lovely gentleman. He, um, I was at an audition, I want to say 2012-ish, and he was like, oh, I'm so tired, I was going to play D&D, &D. and I hadn't heard the words uttered since I was 13. I didn't really think about the game. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I left it hard because of the satanic panic, it gave away all my books, I just never looked back. And then I got busy with high school and college and pursuing my career, I didn't even think about Dungeons and Dragons forever. Uh... And then um, around 2012, I heard him say this. I'm like, what? Adults are playing Dungeons and Dragons? He goes, oh, yeah, me and Lillard have a game going, and we were up we were up late playing. And I'm like, uh, so I just went home that night, and I went on eBay, and I ordered all my, uh, ordered all my books back mm -hmm. just so I could smell them again, right. just so I could yeah. live in that joy, that remembering that youthful... Yeah. Uh, nostalgia, just at least to look at all the, you know, the the drawings, uh, the Trampier drawing, the uh, the all the um, Errol Otis and all of those Jeff Easley, all of those uh, great artists that that D and D came known for, and um, but I still remember to play with. Yeah. And around 2015, I was like, all right, enough is enough. I want to play D and D again, and I put it on Facebook, and my buddy Yuri Lowenthal. Uh, he uh, he knocks on my door an hour later and he goes, happy birthday. And he's holding the, the starter kit. He goes, I want to play too. Happy birthday. And he hands me the starter kit. I'm like, I love this. So so we vowed that we were going to get a D&D &D game together. And uh, I booked 12 Monkeys and left town. Oh, shit. So for like three-ish years. But in that time, I met uh, David Nett. Uh, who uh, was my trainer for for 12 Monkeys Season 3. Um, and David was like, I'll DM a game for you once you finish your run on uh, your run on um, 12 Monkeys. And so late 2017, started gearing it up. Early 2018, started playing. That game has now been running for five years. Really? So you guys just dip back into it every once in a while? No, we, once a month. Really? I, I usually have about four games a month. Really? Three that I run, or, yeah, three that I run, and one that I'm a player at. And that's and then I do assorted uh, online charity events and stuff. Yeah, I, you sent me a video of, uh, of, of a whole D&D &D game that you guys did. That was David running it, I was believe. That, that was probably... Was that always a sword? Was yes. Deborah Ann Wall in that it one? Had the wonderful, uh, great set. Yeah, yeah, that was so great. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's amazing. Um, so I got a question for you. So when you were first deciding to become an actor, you kind of had this whole thing where you thought maybe you're going to be a graphic designer. I did. And so let me ask you this interesting question: um, What do you think your life would be like if you had gone that way instead of being an actor? Because you were going to do animation, you were even thinking. About, right? Yeah, I was a cartoonist. I was like, yeah, I was always the kid drawing. Um, I was always drawing all the, like, Star Wars characters and stuff, and I was always, like, drawing Garfield and Snoopy and Popeye and all of that. I was going to be a cartoonist. Uh, what would my life be like? I I don't know, because I only am living this one. So, speculatively, uh, it's a completely different field. It's a completely different pursuit. I didn't want to be an animator. Yeah. I want to be a cartoonist. Okay. Yeah. So, I wanted to draw yeah. comics and stuff like that. Um and so I, uh, but I couldn't handle getting notes on my art. Mm -hmm. I didn't like, I didn't like uh, people noting me. Yeah. Like it was the inside of my head. I'm like, that's this is came out the way I wanted it to, and I was stubborn. Uh, but I loved acting because I was doing plays and stuff mm -hmm. and doing again. Playing with action figures as a kid, always telling stories and characters uh, since I was wee, and um, and so I think I think 
uh, ultimately, it just ended up winning the tug of war in my soul, yeah. uh, acting one out uh, around my junior year of high school. Oh, wow. Is when I stopped focusing on drawing. And going the other way. And going into theater. And yeah. Your parents were obviously really supportive. Super of supportive, theater. yeah. And uh, so it must have made it easier. I mean... If I would have said I was going to be an actor, I think my parents would have shot themselves. <laughs> so you must have had great support when you said, hey, this is what I want to well, do. I think, you know, it's, it's, I think growing up, my father specifically, who was not nerdy, mm. um, was always looking for a route into understanding his son. So he wouldn't play D&D &D with me, but he would build me a box to keep all my D&D &D stuff in. Or, uh, you know, supporting me in that way. And then when I started doing theater and stand-up and Second City, I think he completely keyed in and was like, oh, I know what that is. Like, I watch TV. I know what Second City is. I know what comedy is. I know what all of this is. Um, and they could, they could bring friends to, sh to plays that I was in. And so it became a very public... Uh, support system. Kind of like being a football kid right. where your parents come to the games. It was very similar. Uh, and, and he could get his mind around, because he did plays when he was in, in high school and such, and my mom was a singer and she did water ballet, so they understood the performing aspect of, of the calling. You know? <laughs> That's great. They didn't want to do it themselves professionally, but they, they certainly had a flair for uh, understanding drama, understanding theater and stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, they had a background almost in it. They Well, I mean, they did plays in high school and stuff, and my dad did anyway. I don't know if my mom did, but my mom would always be... I, she sang and stuff like that. So, again, it was... It was never... It wasn't like a foreign idea to right. say, hey... And they watched TV, so they, they were like... They were big fans of television, so yeah. they were like, I know what that is, and if my boy wants to do that, hey... You know, you only go around the block once. What did they think when you uh, when they found out you were getting an SNL audition? That was because uh, at that time, it was yeah, ninety five, Mike Myers, ninety five. That was the end of that. It was, yeah. I mean, it was already Farley and those cats. Uh, right, yeah. Uh, ninety five was the year that Will Ferrell got hired. That right, yeah. Cherry O'Terry got hired. Molly Shannon, I believe, was there already. Chris Kattan, Jim great. Brewer. Yeah, they were thrilled. I mean, they had already, again, seen the the trajectory, I guess, because I was doing Second City at the time, and that's what segged me into SNL. Yeah. Yeah. You know. um, why do you think, you know, why do you think you didn't get, get, the, get the part? Do you think they um, had it filled well, up? Or? Well, well. Because you're obviously really talented. Well, so. very kind. I, um, I think, well, I think uh, Jim Brewer... Mm -hmm filled the slot of like new brown haired guy Got it, yeah. uh, and he probably walked in with goat boy and with mm -hmm. Joe Pesci and like just kind of there was sort of this declaration of uh, independence with mm -hmm. that you know what I mean that makes sense yeah, yeah. Um, so you said criticism on your art what do you ever get criticism on your acting oh it's not yeah. um, I don't care it doesn't bother yeah, I mean, I, 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 it's harder to get criticism on your writing because yeah. that's coming from my soul. My acting, um, I think my favorite piece of criticism was uh, I saw it when I was doing The Riches, they go, they should kill that guy off. He's ugly. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I'm like, oh, all right. They should alter their story because we don't like his appearance. Um, I just thought that was very funny. It just yeah. makes me laugh. Yeah. What do you think is the What do you think is the key? Like you've done so much, so many parts. When you look at your IMDb, um, one of my favorite. I love that you're in Boston Legal. I think the the, the with Denny Cray. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, well, I didn't work with him. I worked with uh, James Spader. Right. It's almost like you're a working man's actor in a way. You've done so many different things. Well, it's a profession. I mean, yeah. it's it's a like any other profession. You want it to be long and varied. Um. You had a question, though, in there, and no, it was, it was just a sort of statement. Um, yeah, I don't understand what the what the phrase "working man's actor" means, other than it's a job and everyone works in it. Right. You know what I mean? It's well, it's it's a, it's a being, craft. As opposed to being like uh, you know being on a show for ten years. 
you know, was the goal to do a lot of different things, or did you? Oh, well, well the fact that I've been that shows have been on, that haven't been on for ten years is is not up to me, right? right. The Twelve Monkeys ran for four, which was perfect time. Uh, the uh, the uh, riches got yanked after a, a season and a half. Yeah. So could that have run for five years? Sure, I uh, I wouldn't have said no. So I, you know, we don't pick. You know, I just heard this great interview with Steven Spielberg, and he's talking about uh, he was talking about when Lucas had a film that would come out, he would go to Hawaii before the reviews because he's like, if you're going to get bad news, get it in Hawaii, right? And they had this thing called Lucky Sandcastles, where where Lucas would go to the beach and he would build a sandcastle, mm -hmm. and then overnight, if the so if the tide didn't destroy the sandcastle then uh, the movie will be a success. It's sort of a little superstitious. Yeah. And and I love the idea that you just like, you spend a lot of time, you craft something, you make it, you have zero control of how it's going to be received. Mm -hmm. You can't decide on some, what's going to be a hit. You don't know. And and I think it's fool's errand to, to um, think you can predict what the audience will like. Because... You just don't. You just don't know what they're going to respond to, what they're how things are going to resonate. You just don't know, and so all you can do, the only area you have control over, is in the writing. You have control over the performance. That's where you have control, and so you hopefully shoot from the heart and hope people resonate. Like you hope it resonates with them. Um, so when you go back to the, your question of a journeyman actor or a working man, a working, I don't know the phrase you use. Yeah, working man. Journeyman. Working man. Um, it's all a journey if you're doing a, a show for 10 years or if you're doing 10 shows in 10 years. Um, I did not set out, I just set out to be employed. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Which you did quickly. Yeah, that, it, it yeah. came rather quick. I was hired to Second City at 23. Yeah. Um, Even trying to just move out here, you got... Well, I, I was a little strategic about that. I didn't move to any city I didn't have an agent in waiting for me. So I would always kind of, before I left Chicago, after I got the SNL audition, there were there were agents in New York that were like, hey, uh, why don't you come and interview with us? I'm awesome. So I didn't move to New York without an agent there to put, set me out for things. And then when I came out to LA, I picked an agent in New York that had a bi-coastal representation. So by the time I was coming out for pilot season, I had an agent out here in LA rooting for me, sending me out and stuff. So I never did the uh, just jump off a bus and see what happens. Right. Uh, even in Chicago, when I got out of college, I got a job at uh, tearing tickets at Second City Northwest mm. and taking classes there so that when I wanted to move downtown Chicago, I knew there would be a job, just a, a bread and butter job waiting for me where I would be watching improv, watching sketch, bartending, waiting tables, uh, tearing tickets, seating the room, and doing that. Uh, a, a wonderful performer named Holly Wartell, when I was a, uh, uh, a student at Loyola University, she was in the training company of Second City. Very funny woman. Uh, I saw her, and we watched the show, and I was like, Drink everything I can because I, I just want to be Bill Murray. It's all I've ever right. wanted to be. Uh, I just want to be a Ghostbuster. You saw my pack. Uh, yeah. And so uh, I just asked Holly, I'm like, how do you get into Second City? I think I was all of 17. Mm. And she goes, get a job there. Mm. Like, get a job. So you're watching the shows and you're yeah. soaking it in and you're, you know, putting in your 10,000 hours of observation while you're taking classes and right. studying. Um, and so I. That was that I was just hellbent for leather, like all through college. When you get out, you go and you get a job tearing tickets to Second City. Yeah. Just do that. Just get in the ground level and like join the circus, man. And so, just get in the door. Right. Yeah. And so, and that was all with the goal of going someday I want to do Saturday Night Live. Because mm. I wanted but to be. That was the end game. At, ultimately, yeah. uh, at 23, that was the end game, right. was because I wanted to be on SNL. Yeah. And then Saturday Night Live, uh, often pulled their talent from Second City. And so I wanted to put myself in that position that people would see me. Yeah. And then I came out here in 2000 to find a place to live. And one of my first jobs was on Angel. Right. 
And uh, that sort of opened up the door to doing genre, which is what I watched anyway. Right. I was a Star Wars kid. I was a Ghostbusters kid. I was an Empire Strikes Back, Star Trek, all of it, Raiders of Lost Ark. I was, I was the, the cliche, Stranger Things, nerdy 80s right, right. kid, mm -hmm. as you can see. Yes. And so... Um, yeah, like th that was always the goal was to and Ghostbusters was perfect because it was comedy and it was sci-fi, yeah, uh, and horror. Like it's yeah, just it's kind of comedy. a perfect little film. So um, after SNL didn't happen, so then what? So like you say, right, now we right. Uh, well, I hadn't moved to New York yet, but but I had an agent saying it's time to leave Chicago. I said great. I had done all the things that I'd set out to do in Chicago. I had written shows for Second City. I had that on my resume. I had those experiences, made all those friends. And now it was time to to move to New York because I always wanted to live in New York. So I lived there for five years doing um, experimental theater with experimental improv uh, with a group called Burr Manhattan. And we were slugging it out in the Lower East Side in black box theaters for 30 people on Friday nights. And then we would go have... Go have a whiskey and a smoke. Uh, I don't smoke anymore. Kids don't smoke. <laughs> Maybe a little whiskey though. Uh, uh, still do the whiskey. Um, but uh, those were uh, those like that was my mid twenties. So I moved. I moved to. I moved to New York when I was twenty seven, and um, it was uh, it was stunning. Twenty seven. I moved there in ninety five. So twenty seven going on. Wait. Come on, Todd. Yeah, 27. I was 27. Yeah, yeah. I was probably 26 going on 27. Uh, ish. Because I moved in October. Uh, very important details. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, then it was like, okay, not if it's not SNL, I want to do a half-hour sitcom. Because this was the height of Friends and the height of Will and Grace. And, right. and I just want to do a half-hour sitcom. Which I did, yeah. Uh, Sean Hayes and I went to college together. And oh, really? so, he helped that introduction to that casting people and he, he's always been uh, love that a, a great uh, supporter and he's a lovely guy. Uh, so then I was like, I just want to do half-hour sitcoms. Mm. That's what I'm going to do. And I came out to L.A. and I booked several half-hour pilots uh, that didn't go to series. One of my first jobs wasn't a sitcom. It was like a YA with uh, Catherine Town and Jared Padalecki, a 17-year-old oh, yeah. Jared. Really? It was called, yeah, it was called Close to Home. Uh and uh, that was one of my earliest jobs. And then I booked multi-camera sitcoms that didn't get picked up for series. I've done, like, this sounds weird because there's a band called it, but I've done 21 pilots. Really? Yeah, yeah. That never got picked up for series. Wait, no. Two of them might have got picked up. The Riches was picked up. Something else. Uh, it gets old. I get old. No, Foggy you, break. Well, you've done a lot. You know, it's, yeah. It's amazing how much. But that was the goal was half hour just to, to come in and do the sitcoms. Because, I mean, I know you got this whole comedy drama thing going. Yeah. You kind of came from comedy, but you've done a lot of drama. Yeah. What do you, what do you, I don't want to say what do you prefer, but what's your... Is is a mix of that your favorite? Yeah, I think so. I think um, bringing comedy to a drama yeah. uh, it makes for an interesting character. Because mm -hmm. um, life is absurd and... and and I like being the character that kind of sees that absurdity right. and can comment on it. Um, I like drama because uh, the characters arc and they change over the course of a show, a series. Uh, I like comedy because I like the mental gymnastics of figuring out the math of the timing of how the joke works. And when you get really good sitcom writing, when you think about the greats, like, you know, Norman, Norman Lear and... Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you go all the way yeah. back, just to, just the odd couple, right. uh, when, odd and, couple. And, and like Neil Simon and like, you go back to all of those, like I watch Ms. Maisel and I'm like, oh, I just want to do that show. Oh, that's cool. Uh, I don't know if you watch it, Mrs. Maisel. <laughs> it's brilliant. It's like every week is like a Neil Simon play mm -hmm. and it's just patter, rapid fire, sharp turns i love that stuff because it's a great workout mm. it's a great mental workout drama i like because uh 
like I said, the characters can grow and arc and change and over the course. And like where Deacon began on 12 Monkeys as to where he ended is just the breadth of, of what they wrote for me was huge. Yeah. And okay. Even so, with, uh, even with this too. Right. So this is what I wanted to get into with you because I think that you're filling a gap in, in, uh, in acting and in content and in entertainment that we get that is totally interesting. Like your characters have this flavor to them. Um, it's, I don't want to say it's sarcastic or it's salty, salty. Yeah. yeah. And it's this, it's this wonderful thing. And I noticed that, that Captain Shaw and Deacon kind of have almost a, a little bit of the same flavor. Do you? Well, they have the same pilot. <laughs> is, that, is that what it is? I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's me serving the meal, right? right, right. So that is a consistency. Yeah. We, we, we watched, you had the rest of the question. There was something that you were driving towards and I interrupted you. Oh, um, uh, we watched Undiscovered Country last night, mm. and I was like, I was like, because somebody asked me what it takes, what what is it that makes him a great captain? I think Robert. Yeah. Asked did he ask that, that question? Yes, he did. Yeah, yeah, what makes a great captain? I'm like, I can't answer that because great is determined by other people, right? Yeah. Uh, I think the captains that I find memorable mm. are the ones that really bring themselves to the role yeah you can hear the the voice of the performer underneath mm -hmm. the actor and i look at i look at uh kind of answer them out like there's fairies about right um anson mount is uh fantastic as pike uh he's fantastic as pike and and again, I came up with Kirk, and I came up with uh, came up with Picard, and, and vastly different. I probably err more in the Pike Kirk. Mm. Uh, there's a little there's a little swagger and scoundrel to them. Yeah. Um, but the way he sees, you know, the rules and efficiency of Starfleet, there's there's some more Picard in him, in terms of his military stance on how you run a ship. Yes. Uh, uh, but in style and performance, I think uh, I err in the the Pike uh, Kirk world. Um, but I think what makes a memorable captain is, and the memorable character, not just captains, but a memorable character is when the when the actor brings their thing. Yeah. What's their thing? How do they spin these plates? You right. know, and and I only spin plates the way I spin them, and and hopefully. People want that, want yeah. to keep hiring me to do that. Um, and at the same time, in terms of makeup, psychological makeup, Deacon and 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 Deacon and uh, and, and Shaw are worlds apart. Right. Like their worldview are worlds apart. Their the core of who they are are vastly different people right. uh and their experiences clearly are completely different but both. there's a roguishness i yeah. think to both characters yeah that tend to bring to i like that i like those again i like i i grew up wanting to be bill murray han solo yeah. even even tom hanks always had a bit of like mischief yes and twinkle underneath what he's doing yeah. provocateurs yeah that's the i thing. love provocateurs yeah. uh bugs bunny bugs, uh, yeah, i, I love i love people that kind of poke the eye of authority a little bit mm -hmm. uh but they're deft enough to not really get caught doing it right <laughs> you know what I mean? you still well i think you nailed bugs bunny perfectly bugs bunny is a shit but you love him you just can't help it and which gets me to shaw and it's the first time i've ever run into a captain that i kind of couldn't stand <laughs> and then ended up loving welcome to my wheelhouse yeah yes dude yeah. i mean like that's I, what i do it's amazing how you pull that off because, oh, uh, and, and I got to tell you, you steal Picard season three. Oh, good Lord. So and I, and I listen, that's, that is high praise that, and, uh, uh, I, uh, uh, you know what? Don't interrupt a man. When that's right. You might as well keep it going. <laughs> um, you know, I think one of the things about Star Trek and we can go back because, you know, we're, we have our criticisms of new Trek, you know, and, um, and so one of the things that we love about Picard season three is we feel like it's a kind of a return to Berman era Star Trek in a way. 
I think yeah, it has that Nick done. Nick Myers uh, yeah. flavor definitely. Terry's done, Terry's done a great job of like getting that feel back to yeah. it, and so but the element of seriousness of of drama, the fact that you can come in and break that up, and then as you go through the series, there's this the the humor that you bring throughout the series gives us just enough lightness to kind of you know air the whole thing out. And yeah, he, he gets to be a little bit of a Greek chorus, right? Um, and he gets to he gets to not only like poke the eye of these legends, mm -hmm. he also gets to wink at the franchise as a whole without getting meta. Yeah. Uh, he's just so not impressed with them, right. which is what I love about him. So he's awesome. just not impressed, and that actually helped, you know, in doing the show itself. Like yeah. the character getting step on set with these legends, and I had worked with. Uh, with Frakes before, uh, but I had not met. That's not true. I I had met Brett Spiner when I had had a few at Comic Con <laughs> once, and he was kind <laughs> enough to post for a picture with me on an aircraft carrier, That's cool. where like Shatner was landed in a helicopter because <laughs> Shatner. Because Shatner. Uh, but he's a bit of a Greek chorus. Mm -hmm. He's the guy that goes. Can you believe this? Like, he's that guy who gets to look at, like, the absurdity of things that are going on and go, can you believe, like, what? We're doing what? Okay. Like, yeah. he suffers through it. He's a bit beleaguered. Right. Uh, he's tired. Mm -hmm. But he also isn't wrong. <laughs> right. That's a good point. So what was it like being, you know, working with Patrick Stewart and just kind of the whole being in the gang? What, what did it feel like to you? in that experience it I was very very fortunate that uh, the pump was primed for me like when I got there because again Frakes I had uh, I had a, a, a friendship and a working relationship with uh, we didn't know each other well just working we'd work together mm -hmm. and I'd seen him since I had worked on some things with him and we always got on like we we're cut from the same cloth and uh that is the greatest thing to come out of this is is to meet people that i think will be lifelong friends but so when i got to set terry uh had already like said hey my buddy todd's coming in da, 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 da. and so so i walked into a very warm room uh and, and as opposed to often as a guest star you're like I don't want to upset the furniture. This was like, well, this is your bridge, so own it. And uh, this is your ship, so own it. And people let me do it. Like, they were like, you're the captain of this ship, and so you get to be that. And then Todd, as a performer, uh, Jerry was so welcoming. Everyone was so welcoming. Like, they were just so kind and so fun. And uh, they were happy to be playing with each other again. And they did not treat me like the new guy. They treat me like, come on in. You're one of the family. It was wonderful. So do you get invites to the uh, their now famous get-togethers? Or do you think that's going to happen? Well, I, the, the one, that, uh, the one that, that, that happened at Christmas, it's funny because we didn't reveal my character for... Uh, till, till like recently. a week ago, right? Um, and so I'd always see like Comic Con, I'd see all these events, uh, and I, I always felt like, oh, my family's having a party without me. Uh, and so, so I have had to lay low, uh, per the uh, you know the, the 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 dictums that came down from Paramount. Uh, so I have had to kind of keep my head down. But there will be gatherings in the future. I have already. Uh, got a table set up to play D and D, and Jerry has promised, and uh, Mika Burton's coming, and oh, uh, nice. and uh, and Will oh, really? Wheaton wants yeah. to roll dice, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna put together a Trek uh, D and D table. Oh, uh, be fun. It'll be fun. Yeah, it'll be fun. Yeah. So yeah, these are these are people that uh, again, you know, you meet a person and you feel like you've you've had the opportunity to know him a long time no, forever yeah, yeah. yeah. but so, I, I i was fortunate that the path was laid out for me speaking of uh people you've known for a long time tell us the terry matala story where did that start oh tale as old as time <laughs> um terry and i 
We didn't meet on Enterprise, yeah. which is, but we may have. Maybe, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, remember. we were on the same set together, right. but we never, I, we never met. I met Terry when I went in to audition for 12 Monkeys. Mm. And uh, he was very kind. He was a fan of the riches. And so, uh, again, walking into a warm room where people are like, oh, please come do your thing. Yeah. You're invited to the table to do your thing. And then I remember, and the character as written was the sort of Ed Harris type, this right. kind of Marine uh, roughneck feeling character. And I'm like, well, that's not what I do. And, and if they're calling me to audition for this, I have to bring to the table my jam. And so I did my thing. Again, I just did some semblance of Bill Murray. And, uh, you know, um, and, uh, and I think uh, there's a moment where, where Deacon introduces himself to Cole. Mm -hmm. And then he goes, I'm Cole. And I go, I'm Deacon. But I think in my audition, instead of shaking a hand, because it, it was a reader, I curtsied. And Terry's like, that's when you got the part. Really? He's like, when you curtsied, that's when I know, like, this is the guy. Um, and then they had machinations to, uh, so then I went and did, uh, I, I technically did four episodes, but I really did two, mm -hmm. uh, because I was just the tag on the end of two other episodes. And then I acted fully in two episodes. So I was in four episodes of season one and then they had ideas to expand the, uh, ensemble. And he was like, Hey, we've got so many ideas for Deacon for season two. And I'm like, do tell mm. uh and he was like um and then he immediately called casting and said make out a series regular and i was like wow this is the best breakfast i've ever had I mean, he literally texted casting while we were sitting and he was pitching me what he wanted to do with deacon for season two and that launched this collaboration uh going forward and we um we just, we, we get each other and I get to, you know, he understands like how to use what I do and I get to do what he writes. Mm -hmm. And, and I also, again, and, and Picard was populated by a bunch of 12 monkeys writers. So Chris Monfett and Sean Tretta. And so these guys you know, I am not the character. Like, we are the character. Mm -hmm. uh, they created this. They created Deacon. They created Shaw. I come in there. I bring, you know, flavor. my flavor to it. And then things shift and change. And you go, okay, let's even more make it. Let's make this. Let's harmonize. Let's make this song work. Let's write to what you do. And then together we now make this character. Uh, and so, again, I've been fortunate to have a working relationship uh, with Terry since 2014. Wow. Yeah, so almost a decade. So what made him say, you know, I got to have Todd? I don't know. I wasn't in on that conversation. Nothing. You guys haven't talked about it since? No, I, you know, I think there was a role that he had, had me in mind for for season two that didn't pan out. And Thank God. Yeah, good Lord. I don't know why I'm knocking on wood because I don't know what you... what. What's the superstition for, I'm so glad that that didn't happen? Is What's the phrase, dodge the bullet? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I didn't dodge a bullet. The, the actor they cast was wonderful. Like <laughs> So, uh, well, but it, I, I, what I would say is, um, you know, the, 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 the river of destiny flowed differently. Yeah. And so uh, I feel like, well, I'm, kind of, I'm super glad that that, was, that role was not the one for me. And... And this opportunity came up. I don't know. They knew they wanted somebody that would butt heads with uh, with with the legends, yeah. and um, and so I guess he was starting to call Captain Stashwick in the writers' room, and then he came to me and said, "Hey, uh, we got this part for you on Picard season three. And then my joke is. I, you know, I was like, well, that's great. I can't wait to get to see who plays it. Because, you know, nine times out of ten in this town, when you hear this role was written for you, it just doesn't always 
the way the system works, it doesn't always work that you're the one who gets to play it. And so politics. as a, a, a man of his, I don't even know if politics or if things shift, I have been the guy that's gotten the part that was written for somebody else in other times. It's just oh, it's the, 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 the casting process, the whatever, that actor's busy. It's just like there's a, there's a thousand things that, that go into it. And uh, somehow I threaded this needle and got, this role and so uh he said this to me and i was like all right he's like just sit tight we just you know there's some hoops that have to be jumped through in terms of paperwork and us clearing uh, our casting and finishing out all of our casting and lo and behold i think late august of 2021 mm -hmm. he was a man of his word and the offer came through and i was finding myself being fitted for my starfleet uniform what did it feel like putting that uniform on? It's surreal, right? It's surreal. Because it wasn't cosplay. And it's like when I did Enterprise. Mm -hmm. And they fitted me for my ears and they put my eyebrows on and they this. And I'm in my silver jumpsuit and I've got my Lirpa and I'm standing on Vulcan. I'm like, it doesn't feel any different than playing it in your backyard, except this has been blessed. Like, this is the real deal. It's you're officially on Vulcan and you are a Romulan and you're officially on the bridge of the Titan and you are the captain. And you know, it's, it's all the, it's all the dreams you dream of when you're playing in your backyard and you're playing with the kids. Right. And, and you're, and you're 10 years old and you're playing with your action figures, all that. Right. And then you're just going, so it was never lost on me when I was actually doing it. It was never lost on me. This is why the role's so good, because your heart's in it. It's really, it shows through. And yeah. For Shaw, you know, um, we, we know in the beginning that he's, he's kind of, he doesn't really love these legends. But then later on you find out why, which we won't talk about, spoil at this moment. But there's a really good reason why Shaw is feeling the way he's feeling. And, Pain uh, comes from someplace. It does. And I think you really tapped into that without giving away too much. Um, would, would you like to see this storyline continue? Of course. The people that are in it. Of course. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I you know, and, and I've said before, like, if there is, if there is more story to tell, uh, I'd be happy to tell it. Mm -hmm. If, uh, if this is all I get to say, man. That's a great, what a ride. You did it. Right? Yeah. What a ride. Yeah. So I, I am cool either way. I am cool either way. Like, it's already been, you know, checked off so many of the boxes and, and bucket lists and all of that and and the relationships and friendships I made. And, 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 and again, nobody's even really seen it yet and the, and the kindness that has come from it, from the fan base, and 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 uh, you know, being a fan of things myself, I I I know the the love that people have for a, a product, and my job is just to be the best custodian of that as I can, you know, and 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 respect respect what it is that you're that you're carrying, mm. you know. And at the same time, try to do something wholly yours. Yeah. Like, bring to the work the best work you can bring to it. And uh, and all the, like you said, all the heart and love that you can bring to it. And show up and know your lines. Like, <laughs> and yes, yeah. Um, you know, the one thing we love about Terry making Star Trek, and we've been made no bones about it, we believe that we really hope that the future of Star Trek includes him making more Star Trek because huh. we feel like he's found the heart and soul of what legacy Star Trek is Yeah. Um, and, and going forward. Um, so just how do you feel about um, Terry's love for Star Trek? Can you talk a little bit about it's how? An, it's indelible, right? He, I will say, Terry's love for story shows and what you do see is he he wants to I mean I, it's been a little he wants to give people the feelings that he got from the things that he loved growing up and so 
he has he has such an affection for a certain kind of storytelling, and it's a very romantic kind of storytelling. This, Terry is an optimist, and Terry is he, he's a he's a romantic, uh, and I mean that in the grand sense of the term. Like he he loves the when when cinema can take you away and make you feel um, and make you think and, and all of that. He, he's romantic and, and I too am that. And so in whatever story he's choosing to tell, whether it's 12 monkeys or whatever he's, you know, putting his energy into assembling the team of the people that he trusts to, also be stewards of whatever the story is you know that he's he's working hard to give people the experience that that he had as a boy you know it all comes from that place with me and and him and of i just want to carry people away the way i was carried away you know when i was eight years old when i saw star wars i was i was 1974 when I was playing Star Trek mm -hmm. or Raiders and all of that stuff that gave us that feeling and without being slavish to nostalgia mm -hmm. trying to make something new but in the same way that you know what I'm about to compare you to Steven Spielberg and George Lucas Terry <laughs> write this down <laughs> this is the day but without being so if you look at like what Spielberg and Lucas did they they were inspired by the serials uh, Lucas, uh, you know, Spielberg was trying to make Casablanca and Lawrence of Arabia and, and all of that and the things that, and give people the, those feelings that he had, but through a wholly new creation or through a whole new medium. And Lucas the same with Star Wars writing, you know, and, 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 and again, Nicholas Meyer, like you look at Wrath of Khan and, and, and how he was, and I love motion picture, I do. It's got that lovely 2001. Yes. Uh, it's a, it's just a beautiful yeah. piece of cinema. But the sort of the... There's a lot of swash in my buckle, and I love a bit of swashbuckle in my, in my grand storytelling. Um, and there's the playfulness that came back with Wrath of Khan. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's a joy there. So... so Terry understands, I think, intrinsically how to entertain and move people and thrill people. And, and he also knows how, the te how to put together that team with, yeah. with, the, with you know, putting the writer's room that he put together mm -hmm. to help uh, craft these, these stories. And then the casts that he puts together and the DP that he, that he hires. And, you know, it's just funny. If you look at if you look at 12 Monkeys, which I'm glad is getting a bit of a resurgence because yeah. people are like digging in, uh, it's it's Trek. Yeah. There's a captain and she's on a bridge 100%. and she has a team that does away missions yeah. Yeah. and it, there's big bads and yeah. there is, you know, essentially like... It's, so he was doing Trek before he did Trek. He kind of was, but he was doing Trek before he did 12 Monkeys because he worked on... He worked on Enterprise, and he worked on... I think he said he was a PA on Voyager. Yeah, he was a PA on Voyager, and a little that, bit of DS9. A little, so, he was learning, like me, watching Second City yes. from the... Like, just drinking it all in, all motivated from his love of these movies and these TV shows when he was a, a younger man. And he's... He's younger than me. Yeah. Uh, but... Uh, Not that much. He's the age I was when I got hired to 12 Monkeys. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think 46, right? Yeah, something like that. He's 47, I think. 47. Now. Yeah. That's how old I was when I got hired to 12 Monkeys. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I got me off on a thought there, but um, so, um, so Hollywood really, I mean, this is what Hollywood needs. You know, we do, you know, we're critics in a way, but. Um, you're this, consumers we're consu exactly we're fans yeah and the the experience and I don't mean that in a bad way meaning you yeah. you, you you consume the entertainment and then you have a, a, an opinion about it right right yeah. and you we, like what you like you don't like what you don't like yeah exactly right. and uh, we feel like what you guys have brought to us here in 12 monkeys and and, and of course in Picard season three is is exactly what Hollywood needs they need more of this 
more heart, more story, more character driven. You know, there's a lot of things out there that are kind of weak. There's some great stuff out there, but in the science fiction genre specifically, we need more of what we've loved. Not so much Easter eggs and and uh, fan nostalgia service. for the sake of fan service, but more let's tell the story. So yeah, I think um, I think. It, it goes back to what you were saying, which is heart. Uh, I think if people are making the things, and look, it's a business. People are trying to sell T-shirts. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, uh, it's a business. Uh, this is an occupation. Mm -hmm. uh, you bring a thing, you create it, you bring it to market, and you sell it to people because people, you know, this is how we get paid. This is how I eat. This is how, you know, Patrick makes a living. Um that being said, it's also a passion. And I think when the, when, the, when the filmmaker or the writer or the actor is passionate about what they're doing, uh, you're already halfway there, right? And I think um, without being, like I said, without being nostalgic, I think there is a way to recognize the through line of the heart of all of those things that inspired you. So, you know, there's going to be a generation of people that, so Lucas was inspired by John Ford and, and, and Spielberg was inspired by, by, uh, the name who directed Casablanca. It was actually Ford. That did. Ford didn't direct Casablanca. No, but I think Spielberg met Ford. Spielberg yeah, met Ford. Yeah, if yeah. you watch Fablements. Yeah. Um, uh, but, but, uh, Jimino? Oh, who directed Casablanca? My bad. I can't so, remember. at any rate, uh, the, uh, so Spielberg is carrying those, that passion and legacy into his films. Then young, Terry Metalis sees, grows up with those and then puts that kind of heart and that inspiration into his work. Ideally, somebody will, you know, watch Picard season three, who's 14 or 15 now and be like, and by the way, my 15 year old, uh, she has seen the first four episodes oh, nice. and with zero context. Yeah. She did not grow up with Star Trek and she just was like, yeah, let's watch the next one. Let's watch the next one. Let's watch the next one. Oh, that's awesome. She could care less what dad is in. Right. Like, truly. She but she was just like, these are great. And so the fact that it, it somehow connected with a 15-year-old, mm. uh, I think there's going to be, and you have a lot of parents that, like us, you know, legacy going, please, child, this is this is what I give you. Yes, I'm making um, my kids to do it. Yeah, indoctrinating them. Yeah. Um, they're going to grow up and, and be inspired by this and want to put that kind of heart and passion into their work. And so I think, and, and the reality is, when you say we need more of it, the Spielbergs and the Lucases, they were rare, even at the time, which is why we still talk about them. Right. So when we say Hollywood needs more of, well, I guess Hollywood's always needed more of. Mm -hmm. It's They're not easy to come by. What we do is not easy. I mean, we do collectively. I don't mean like me as an actor. Uh, it's hard work. Like, it's time consuming. Um, but it's, it's the amount of people that are involved to create a thing is, uh, it's not easy. It's not easy to make this stuff. That's why it's so, that's why I guess it, it's hard when you go to the internet and people just, crap on stuff and you go you know how hard it was to make that episode of television right and then you just wiped out in three seconds with it with, with a, a dismissive treat you know i, I hear people again uh, bag on a uh, new track or whatever right. and again it's like and yet there's somebody out there that loves it right. and there's somebody out there that it will inspire them to make art it will inspire them uh and nobody is setting out to make something bad that's a great point. Nobody's ever setting out to make something bad. Everybody hopes it's good. And and it's speaking yeah. to somebody. And it speaks to somebody, exactly. Um, I think people are responding to Picard season three because I think 
there is so much heart in it. Yeah. It's and there's affection uh, for nostalgia. There is that old feeling. It's appropriate. That come, it's appropriate. Yeah, it's I don't think a, it's it's not a it's not a slavish Valentine. It's uh, and it's something new. It's a new story with mm-hmm. new things happening again. When you like watch Wrath of Khan, these are characters who were in their fifties right. when they were making it. Here's a, a fun tidbit: at the height of Picard's uh, captainhood, he was the age I am now. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, Which is fun, career. and that's also how old uh, how old uh, Kirk was in Wrath of Khan. Really, is, is the age I was. Oh, yeah. Little known, I didn't know that. Pretty fun. Yeah, that's great. Pretty fun. Uh, um, yeah. So, just real quick, Shaw's. Can you just give us Shaw's philosophy? Um, we've seen now episode one, so we get to see that. He has no problem eating amongst uh, while while the legacy <laughs> while the, the people watch him, and uh, and he's got his opinions. But what is his just if you can his philosophy as a Starfleet officer and and uh, what can you tell us without giving too well, much? Well, he's <sighs> he's on an exploratory vessel. Hmm. He's a very curious man. Um, he likes to understand how things work and operate and uh and so his curiosity uh he's also really jaded mm. like he's got a lot of he's a jaded there how he and i differ uh i'm not a jaded person uh he's very cynical and jaded uh and that fights against his his sense of wonder and and curiosity um, but for reasons, he needs to run a tight ship. He needs to, like pathologically, <laughs> needs to. Right. He needs to to keep everyone safe. Mm. That is his like his ethos is like uh, we are going to do this job. We are going to do it exceptionally well. And I'm going to, I, I'm not going to lose a crew member. Right. Like, that is off the table. And so, he, he white knuckles procedure because there's safety in it. And I'm not saying he's without risks. Mm-hmm. He takes risks. He, he, he's throwing himself into the great unknown. Oh, yeah. It's an exploratory vessel. Mm-hmm. So all the stuff that he did prior to me, it's like, he, it's not that he hasn't been in a scuffle. Mm-hmm. Like, he knows, he knows the dangers are out there, and yet he still proceeds. But he will then use Starfleet procedure as a blanket. to do the job. He had to get the job to, as a blanket. Yeah, this his conflict is, comes through with those elements, I think. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. Um, but he also knows knows when to take the risks that need to be taken. He he, he weighs his decisions very hard. Mm. He's not a very glib from the hip uh, captain. Right. No. He may be presentationally. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. But look, if, if you know if. if Terry s- sounds the horn of Gondor. <laughs> he has my sword. Right. It's I think enough. fans will really respond to the season. They yeah. Are. And I think, I think they will be like, I think they'll go, I mean, Jesus Christ, they, they gave Pike his own series after seeing him as a guest star. In two right. episodes. Yeah. Right. They, they'll listen. If they go, this is where the, the bread is buttered. Yeah. They'll listen. Uh, I saw your Terry Trent hats. hats. Oh, dude, we are so... I talk to them, I go, I don't want a Terry Trent hat. We thank Todd Stashwick for giving us this interview. He was incredibly kind and thoughtful, which is also a glimmer into the heart of Captain Shaw. Stashwick, as well as Shaw, gives us a lot to think about. We are excited to see what legacy both men leave on the Star Trek franchise. 